Hey everyone, don't let the video title scare you. This won't be a super technical video, but we'll simply delve into some basic principles of statistics and how they relate to a strong skeptical tool set. They will protect you from being fooled by media reports that often misrepresent the findings of scientific studies for sensationalist purposes. Perhaps most importantly, statistical literacy is an essential component of critical thinking, and this tool set will help you in countless areas of everyday life. In many ways, understanding statistics is integral to understanding science, as many of the principles that relate to good science have everything to do with statistics. Let's explore some of these. In many ways, statistics is unintuitive and goes against humans' default method of thinking, which tends to rely on emotion, anecdotes, and a whole host of cognitive biases, some of which I've covered in previous videos. It takes practice to shift one's thinking away from these default biases to a method grounded in robust skepticism and science-based thinking. Let's start with something called the base rate. Base rates are a statistical measure of what percentage of a population has a particular characteristic. This statistic is then used as the base or prior probability upon which to compare other measurements. For example, let's say we are told that 2,000 people have improved or cured their back pain using a type of treatment. This might sound impressive on first glance, but then we find out that 200,000 people tried the treatment, which means that 198,000 or 99% did not improve while using the treatment, and only 1% did which makes it clear how effective or ineffective the treatment potentially was. Without this base rate to provide a basis for comparison, we can easily fall victim to the base rate fallacy. In other words, we need to understand the overall context. If we know just the numerator of a fraction, it would be meaningless without the denominator to give it context. Another slightly more detailed example Let's say the incidence of a particular type of cancer occurs at a base rate of 6 per 1,000 people, or 0.6%. Let's further suppose we have a test that falsely detects cancer in 3% of patients who do not have cancer, but that if the patient really does have cancer, the test never fails to detect it. If we are screening a random patient and perform the test on them and detect cancer, what is the likelihood that the patient really does have cancer in the absence of any other information we have. Many people would say 97%, but the correct answer is more like 17%. So we would take 994 people who don't have cancer times by 0.03, the false positive rate, and get just under 30. Then we take the six people who actually have and are correctly diagnosed with cancer, and we add that to 30, we get 36. Six people out of the 36 is just under 17%. This is counterintuitive, but it's true. Following from the base rate, let's look at a distinction that is often ignored in the media's reporting of scientific findings, the difference between relative risk and absolute risk. Risk is a measure of the probability that a negative outcome will occur, but there are different kinds of risk. Suppose you see a media headline that reports that CT scans in childhood triple the chance of brain cancer. This might be a cause for alarm, but then we find out that the overall risk, or base rate, is roughly one case per 10,000 children aged 0 to 9. The report of tripling the chance refers to the relative risk. A relative risk tripling, or a 200% increase, of 1 per 10,000 would be 3 per 10,000 or two additional cases. So three in 10,000 becomes the absolute risk, much less scary sounding. Now suppose you see another media headline that reports that a glass of red wine raises the lifetime risk of breast cancer by 5%. Then you discover the base rate or prevalence of breast cancer is one in eight or 12.5%. Say the rate for non-drinkers is 1 in 9, or 11.1%, meaning 111 women out of a random group of non-drinking women of 1,000 will get breast cancer. An increase of 
means this 11.1% increases to 11.7%. This increases the total number of breast cancer cases to 117 out of 1,000, six additional cases per 1,000. So, absolute risk describes the overall risk of an outcome over a time period, with or without a specific behavior that may affect it. Relative risk describes how much more likely that outcome will occur given a specific behavior. By only reporting on one of them, you leave out vital information. A large sounding increased relative risk of a deadly disease might not mean much if the absolute risk is still tiny. On the flip side, a smaller relative risk increase or decrease might change the absolute risk big time. So always look at both. Related to the absolute and relative risks are measurements called the number needed to treat and number needed to harm. The former is how many people we'd have to administer a specific intervention to in order to help one person, whether it's save a life, prevent a disease, and so forth. The latter is how many people would have to be exposed to a certain risk to produce harm. Again, whether take a life, cause a disease, etc. For example, Let's say statins, a medication used to prevent heart attacks, were given to 10,000 people. Let's say the number of deaths from heart attacks in the statin group goes down from 50 to 40, a relative risk reduction of 20%, and an absolute risk reduction of 10 out of 10,000, or 0.1%. To get the number needed to treat, we take 1 divided by the absolute risk, and we get 1,000. So in this example, we'd have to treat a thousand patients with statins in order to save one life due to heart attacks, which is about what a 2011 Cochrane review found to be the case. As we just saw, in order to know exactly how many people this will actually help, we need to know the absolute risk reduction as well. The number needed to treat is another way of providing clarity to the question. For an example of the number needed to harm, let's go back to our breast cancer example. We found that one alcoholic drink per day led to six additional cases of breast cancer per 1,000 women. That was the increase in the absolute risk. So we simply take 1,000 divided by six and we get a number needed to harm of 167. That is, 167 women having an average of a drink per day over their lifetime will lead to one additional case of breast cancer. That brings me to sample size. Sample size is quite simply how many subjects or observations are in your study. Ideally, in controlled experiments, samples will be randomized so as to remove any possible sources of bias among the group that may skew the results. The sample size has to be large enough to mitigate chance events, as well as have adequate statistical power, which means it has to be able to detect what's called the effect size. If we're testing a drug that may only benefit 1 in 100 patients, or may have a serious side effect that affects 1 in 100 patients. A sample size of 50 isn't going to be able to detect this effect. The sample size also has to be large enough to mitigate false positive and false negative results, as we looked at briefly with base rates. Shifting gears a bit, let's tackle two related concepts. The first is standard deviation, a measure of the spread or variation in a set of data. A high standard deviation means the data points extend far from the mean. A low standard deviation means the data are close to the mean. I bring the metric up because it's vital to understanding what's called a normal distribution, or simply a bell-shaped curve, which describes how observations are distributed in terms of standard deviations from the mean, and ultimately in percentile terms. To understand this better, let's look at an example. Intelligence quotients, or IQ tests, a standard metric of intelligence, are designed so that the mean is 100. The standard deviation is 15. The empirical rule, or the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, gives us a way to approximate the proportion of a normal distribution that falls within 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations of the mean. It states simply that 68% of the distribution falls within one standard deviation, 95% within two standard deviations, and 99.7% within three standard deviations. So for IQ test scores, since the standard deviation is 15, 
68% of the test scores fall between 85 and 115. That's 15 points below and 15 points above the mean. 95% of the test scores fall between 70 and 130. That's 30 points or two standard deviations below and above the mean. And 99.7% of the test scores fall between 55 and 145. That's three standard deviations below and above the mean. If someone's test score comes out at say 125, that represents 1.666 standard deviations above the mean, or in the 90th percentile. This can give us a quick reference point to understand reported data from a normal distribution or bell-shaped curve. Of course, not all distributions are normal, but many are. Height, weight, lifespans, errors in measurements, and the aforementioned IQ. Furthermore, many distributions that aren't naturally normal are often transformed by scientists and statisticians so that they are normal to make them easier to analyze. Next, let's look at an indispensable tool of statisticians, p-values and the related confidence intervals. When scientists run a study, they will often calculate what's called a p-value. Before I explain this, let's first look at something called the null hypothesis. In a statistical test, statisticians must first formulate the null and alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is the position that there is no difference between two phenomena or groups, while the alternative hypothesis is that there is a difference. Bear with me, I'll provide an example in a moment. The p-value, which is a probability, and thus falls between 0 and 1, is then calculated. The lower the p-value, the less likely that the observed result was obtained when the null hypothesis is true. If the p-value is really low, we reject the null hypothesis. How low? Statisticians usually set the arbitrary cutoff at 0.05. So if a p-value is obtained that is below 0.05, they reject their null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. If the p-value is over 0.05, they fail to reject the null hypothesis. Note, they do not accept the null hypothesis since you cannot prove it. We can only determine how likely or not it is. This is analogous to the principle of falsification in science, where we cannot technically prove a scientific hypothesis true, we can only fail to disprove it. Repeated failed attempts to falsify the hypothesis eventually lead to a hypothesis being tentatively accepted as a useful theory or model p-values are one tool used to accomplish this. To help understand this, let's consider the analogy of a legal hearing in court. Let's say a defendant has been accused of robbery. The null hypothesis or default assumption is that the defendant is innocent. During the trial, the prosecutor presents evidence. Let's say the police found the defendant at the crime scene with a bag of money, a mask on his face, and a getaway car outside. The jury then evaluates the evidence. This is akin to a hypothesis testing. With the default presumption of innocence, is the evidence against the defendant plausible if the defendant were actually innocent? If the evidence is very unlikely to have occurred by chance, this raises a reasonable doubt about the null hypothesis. While juries don't typically use the standard of one out of 20 or a probability of 0.05, as the threshold to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, they in effect determine the likelihood and then reach a verdict. Note that if the evidence is unconvincing, the jury rules not guilty. They don't rule innocent. This is akin to failing to reject the null hypothesis rather than accepting it. The defendant may in fact be innocent, but they have no way to determine this. They can only rule on whether the evidence is convincing enough or not to establish guilt. Instead of, or in addition to the p-value, it is good statistical practice to report what's called a confidence interval. A confidence interval is an estimated range of values we are pretty sure a true value lies within. It can be calculated to varying degrees of certainty, but the most common are the 95% and 99% confidence intervals. Let's say we were to take a random sample of 50 people from a population to see how much money they spent last year eating in restaurants and found the mean to be $1,000 and the standard deviation 
to be $100. The 95% confidence interval would thus be 1,000 plus or minus 28, or a range from 972 to 1,028. This means that there's a 95% confidence that the true mean amount of money spent falls within this interval. That means that if we were to take repeated samples, that 95% of the time, the mean would fall within the interval. Along with p-values, confidence intervals are another tool that scientists and statisticians use to determine whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, whether, say, a drug that's being tested is likely to have had an effect in treating a condition. Good studies are more likely to report both the p-values and confidence intervals in conjunction with its findings. If the p-value is below the 0.05 threshold, or in other cases, a different cutoff point, statisticians call the finding statistically significant. This means that the relationship between two or more variables is not caused by chance. However, this does not necessarily mean that the finding has clinical or practical significance. That is, whether the findings are significant enough to have any real-world application. A new treatment could just clear the 0.05 statistical significance threshold, but if the number needed to treat, as we discussed before, was too large, it might not be a worthwhile treatment to have. The last principle I'll discuss is one you've likely heard before, that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. Very simply, just because two variables are found to be associated or correlated, it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. There could be a third variable, or many other variables, that could explain the connection. Establishing causation in science can be tricky. The most rigorous way is to set up a randomized controlled trial, which we discussed in the previous video. Randomized controlled trials attempt to set up two or more different groups with just one variable tweaked so as to figure out if that variable is responsible for any difference in outcome. If there is a statistically significant difference found, that is evidence for causation. However, in the absence of being able to do randomized controlled trials, causation can be established through the various observational and epidemiological studies that we also discussed in the previous video. But it is more difficult to do. One way of doing this is through using the Bradford Hill Criteria, or Hill's Criteria for Causation, which was developed in the 1960s. These criteria have been used to establish the connections between alcohol and cardiovascular disease, the association between ultraviolet B radiation, vitamin D, and cancer, and many others. Some other examples of advances in science that were made without randomized controlled trials include the effects of smoking on human health, the discovery of tectonic plates, and the evolution of species. Being aware of these statistical concepts will help you navigate and assess scientific findings much more effectively. They are an essential part of a skeptical tool set that will help you avoid falling victim to the common pitfalls in evaluating science that I discussed in my Science Denialism subseries. In addition to learning these statistical concepts, one of the best ways to become proficient in assessing scientific claims is to observe when science goes wrong. Join me in the next video for a look at the many problems with the peer-reviewed scientific process. Thanks for watching.